I'm delighted today to be joined by Peter Hitchens. Uh, he is a journalist for the Mail on Sunday, the author of many books, including The Abolition of Britain and The Phony Victory. And he is also a former foreign correspondent reporting from Moscow and Washington, DC. Mr. Hitchens, thank you for joining me today. Pleasure so far. <laughs> Good. Um, so you're a thoughtful, long-standing observer of events in Russia and Eastern Europe. Did Putin's invasion of Ukraine surprise you? And have you revised any of your former opinions as a result? It surprised me totally. I, I never thought that he would do anything so crazy or so stupid or so damaging to the cause of his country. And I never thought he would do anything so barbaric. I mean, his, he is, as I've long described him, a sinister tyrant. I've been writing since 2004 about his attacks, particularly on freedom of the press. And have been well aware of that, but in foreign policy terms, I thought that there was some sign of at least intelligent application, but the launch of the invasion just amazed me. And, uh, and I think many people who had previously thought that there was some chance of some sort of, how should I put it, intelligent compromise over the Ukraine issue and between the, the Western nations and Russia on the NATO issue felt after that, that that was gone. And it was gone because of an action by Russia itself. In terms of the geopolitics of the region, what do you think the West has got wrong since the fall of the Soviet Union in, in 1991? Almost everything. The, 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 there's never been, and this is very common in the West in general, an understanding that Russia is not the same as the Soviet Union. Uh, there was never an understanding, it seemed to me, and it, it was obvious to me when I was living there, that the Soviet Union, towards its final years, was in a state of almost totally you know, collapse and nothing worked. It was a heap of rust. Uh, it, it couldn't deliver even the most basic things to itself in its own capital city. Uh, it was sordid, ill-governed, lawless, corrupt. And it, what it needed uh, was several things. It needed the introduction, really, of the rule of law, rather than a, a formal, uh, out, the, the outward forms of democracy which it was given. It needed a proper free press, it needed adversarial parties, it needed the things which, in fact, the, the British, American, and, and to a lesser extent, French occupation of Germany tried to give that country after it was prostrate in 1945. And none of that was done. Uh, also, the, the, the idea then was common that, that gangster capitalism would somehow or other act as a kind of purge of the Soviet system and would turn that country into a healthy economy. Absolutely nothing kind of has happened. Somebody made a very good point the other day that you, you can go practically anywhere and find products made in China, but nobody ever, ever, unless it's a bottle of vodka, looks for a product or a, or a weapon, looks for a product made in Russia. It's not a country which, despite now 30 years after the end of communism, has succeeded in becoming a, a major manufacturing nation or exporter of goods. It's still the most total mess. These things were utterly wrong. And then on top of that, there was the the belief, I think, in some very important American foreign policy circles that the, the Russia shouldn't be allowed to rise again because if it did, it would be a new Soviet Union and would threaten the United States. I think it's a complete misunderstanding what Russia is, as long as it exists, will be a major regional power. But the Soviet Union sought to be a global power. And it's sort of be a global power, particularly with the enormous navy which Sergei Gorshkov built, which I saw sunk at its moorings in Sevastopol in, in 92. And the, the two things had gone completely missing from the Soviet Union that had, that had been that had been there and worked in Russia. One of them was the, the communist ideology and the leading role of the Communist Party, which is completely gone. And the other was this global ambition to rival the United States. Now, there's a lot to talk about nuclear weapons, my own view over years and years and years increasingly is that nuclear weapons are unusable except by complete lunatics and that they therefore don't actually make all that much difference to the exercise of power uh, it's the ability to mount uh, conventional uh, warfare that's the that, that's, that's the serious thing and as we see and i remember having arguments a few years ago with new cold new cold war proponents such as my friend edward lucas and he said no the russian armed forces were were much improved and going from strength to strength. Well, possibly they are improved. They're certainly less drunk than they were under the Soviet regime. But as we've seen in Ukraine, uh, in both at sea and on land, the, neither the Russian army nor the Russian navy is particularly well equipped, nor particularly well trained, uh, nor particularly big. Uh, 
And that's because Russia has an economy roughly the size of Italy's, and it's a country in many ways in serious decline. Uh, it can afford to pay pensions and stuff like that and buy Snickers bars because it has a very large oil income, but this doesn't make it capable of sustaining as necessarily serious armed forces. It's also fantastically corrupt, and this is common in almost all the countries of the former Soviet Empire to this day, but it's appalling in Russia and it's equally appalling in Ukraine, I might add. Yes. And of course, corruption makes it very difficult to build strong state institutions, including armed forces. So it was always seemed to, it always seemed to me to be idle to to, to to believe that somehow or other in 20 or 30 years, Russia could re regain its strength and become a rival again. It's this weird Wolfowitz <laughs> doctrine from which this arises, I think 1992, when Paul Wolfowitz said that Russia shouldn't really be allowed to become a power again, uh, has been pursued more or less ever since. Uh, while at the same time, the, the real challenger to American hegemony in the world, namely People's Republic of China, has grown and grown and grown without restraint. It's, it's bizarre to me that, that these things do seem to me to be mistakes which could have been avoided. And we could then go into, of course, to the, the really curious policy of NATO expansion, uh, which was warned against by everybody from George Kennan to Henry Kissinger to Noam Chomsky, and I, I say this again and again, an issue on which Henry Kissinger and Noam Chomsky are united is quite rare, uh, but the, they're both extremely intelligent men. They both thought it was stupid to, to expand NATO, and I think that this, there needs to be much more of an answer than to say, oh, well, the Eastern European countries wanted to join NATO. Well, maybe they did, maybe they didn't. As far as I know, the only country that held an actual vote on it was Slovenia, and that was a joint uh, EU and NATO uh, vote in a referendum. I'm not sure the people have really been consulted about this very greatly. It was an elite project. And also, if the United States had said you can't join NATO, if the US Senate hadn't voted to expand NATO at the end of the 1990s, it wouldn't have happened whatever those Eastern European countries wanted. And also, what is NATO anyway? And I recently wrote an essay for Compact magazine about the extraordinary change in that organization. It's the only, you hear in the Bible of beating swords into plowshares and beating spears into pruning hooks, the, the, the transformation of NATO since 1989 is the first instance of anybody beating a shield into a sword. I, I look forward to that um, compact piece. But it's we'll a good back. article, I, 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 though I say it myself, I shouldn't. <laughs> I, 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 somebody else should have written it long ago, but as, as yeah. it's often the case, it was left to me. So <laughs> there should have been a better one by somebody else, but you'll have to make do no. with the one by me. No, happily. But you, we'll come to NATO. You, you speak about the corruption and the rule of law there. Do you think that the West um, could have done more in the aftermath of 1991 to ensure that Russia transitioned into a law-governed democracy, or is that more the uh, is, is the fact that it didn't more the result of internal dynamics within? No, I Russia? think it could have been done. I think if the if if we'd gone in friendly fashion to the Russians and said, look, we we, we understand that you're prostrate economically and politically. Uh, and instead of saying, well, OK, as long as you have elections and, yeah. and something called a parliament and elections, the presidency and the the, for, the outward forms of, of democracy, that'll be fine. We, sh we should have been more serious about saying what you really need are the internal uh, engines of these things, which make them work. That's a, you know, such as an adversarial parliament with, with genuinely balanced parties, which are capable of taking over from each other, something which you could learn from the British system, yeah. a yeah. proper free... Uh, proper free press and, and, and a pro properly diverse broadcasting, mm. uh, an education system which uh, which was capable of encouraging encouraging dissent and all kinds of things. Like that. All these things were needed, and I think there were a lot of people in Russia at the time because a huge number of people had the, in the spirit of, of uh, uh, Sakharov and Rostropovich and Solzhenitsyn wanted it to be a free and Christian country again. And interestingly, the, Trump, the, the difference between Russia and the rest of the Soviet Empire at the time was that in Russia, the predominant voice in the overthrow of the Soviet power was a democratic voice. In much of the rest of the Soviet Union, this is still the case, it was a nationalist voice. People who, who felt imprisoned by Soviet power and unable to, to find their destiny as nations. And nationalism, of course, is a wholly different thing from a desire for democracy and for freedom. I think there was a desire for democracy and freedom in Russia. I think that had we spent the time and money that we could and should have done, things might have turned out very differently. It's interesting and it's worth remembering, an oft forgotten point is that Britain, um, you know, had the rule of law and a, a strong sense of national identity long before it was a mass democracy. Democracy is a sort of, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful product of 
a, a well-functioning system. It's not necessarily the cause of a well-functioning system. Well, it's it's right. in fact it's it's it's, it's a, a rather secondary thing to the to the, yes. to the creation of a free society in Hong Kong, uh, when it was still free, uh, was evidently superior in almost every way to the People's Republic of China. Though it had nothing much in the way of democracy, what it did have above all things it was the rule of law. Uh, imposed by a properly independent judiciary and division of powers, and also had a very strong tradition of, of free media and free speech. Yes. And those were the things which the, the Chinese state unerringly suppressed uh, to make it as much like the People's Republic as it could. And that those were the things which Russia badly needed, and it still mm. hasn't got or anything like them. Very interesting. Now, let's, let's talk about NATO then. So how are Russia's security interests threatened by a defensive alliance? And this is my secondary question on top of that. Do you believe that Russian fears of NATO are rational or just that they exist and therefore should be considered by Western policymakers? Mixture of the two. Uh, it's not entirely true to say that NATO is a defensive alliance. Uh, the bitterly remembered in Russia and indeed raised particularly by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in, in 1999 was the NATO in, in, intervention in Serbia. Yes. Uh, remember, during the time of its great success, during the Cold War, when it actually did defeat the Soviet Empire, NATO never actually launched any operations at all. Mm. It, was, it did nothing. It just sat there and existed. Uh, but it was after the Cold War was over and to achieve that victory that it started being used as the, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the vehicle for, for interventions described perhaps as humanitarian, but also having a strong political purpose. And the, the intervention in Serbia was such, an, was such an intervention. It was viewed with considerable shock and dismay in the, it, 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 among the Russian intelligentsia of, of all uh, types, because they, they saw in this a genuine threat. There were lots of arguments which followed after this. I, I haven't got the history at hand about deployments of, of missile shields in former Warsaw Pact countries as well, which the Russians found extremely worrying. They thought that the pretext for them, as they saw it, of defending against a possible attack from Iran, was thin, and they they were not they were not convinced by this. And they did offer various, I think, quite impressive concessions to try and avoid it. They and they also felt that once the country was in NATO, there was absolutely no reason why it should, anybody. Excuse me, just one moment. Of course, of course. Winds got up, a door is swinging. Um, yeah. the, they, they, were, um, they, they were convinced that once the country was in NATO, there was no limit to what uh, could be installed on its territory. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, it, 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 it wasn't possible to say that just because it was in a defensive alliance, that would be the end of it. Uh, that once you have uh, equipment and troops installed and stationed on its territory, then there it is up against their frontiers. Now, I just say to people, uh, particularly American and British people, uh, they, should, they should always remember their incredible geographical good fortune. In Britain here, we are surrounded by deep salt water, which has saved our bacon more than once in our history. The United States has deep salt water on either side, Canada on top and Mexico underneath. Russia has no major physical barrier at any, any part of its borders. It has Germany uh, on one side, China on the other, and it has been invaded by almost everybody in the past few hundred years. And here it's, a, it's an old joke that I remember Shirley Williams once mocked uh, George W. Bush and said that he had once said that uh, the French didn't have a word for entrepreneur. But actually, there is a, a, a thing about the Russian language which people uh, need to know, which is true. The Russian, the most commonly used Russian word for safety or security is Biazapaznost. I don't know if you're a Russian speaker. I know that um, word. Because, I, know I, know I can that word. Word. This I know. The, 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 the name of the, both the FSB and the KGB uh, contains this word, Biazapaznost. The KGB is Komitiet Gosadarsvina Biazapaznost, the Committee for State Security. And the word Bias Pasnos is very interesting because it is a negative word. Bias means without, and the Pasnos means danger. So the word for, for safety in Russia is a negative word, without danger. The default position in, in the Russian mind is that, is, is that they're always in danger. And they might feel more worried about uh, these things than we do because of, because of that reason. If you have all that salt water, uh, you don't need to worry half so much about people barging across your frontiers. But Russia is a country which, in, in living memory, 
uh, it suffered the siege of its second most important city in which hundreds of thousands of people starved to death. There are people you know, still alive who just about remember that. It's not a minor thing. And it, it, it's therefore, the, the creation of a military alliance, however harmless it may appear to be on its borders, uh, is, is going to alarm them. I don't think it's unreasonable. And uh, Putin's question, which he raised at the Munich Security Conference in, in 2007, against whom exactly is this alliance formed? It was also, it was a reasonable question, even though it came from him. People have to understand. It doesn't mean that he, he couldn't ask an intelligent question. Who was it against? And we don't still maintain an, uh, an alliance against the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, or against the Ottoman Empire uh, or indeed against the against the Hohenzollerns. We, we, the, they've been got rid of as a problem. So having had an alliance, a very successful alliance against against the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, both of which have vanished from the face of the earth, what is NATO an alliance against? And the answer to this question uh, was delivered by George W. Bush the following year in the Bucharest NATO conference, uh, when he put up the, the, the biggest two fingers I think ever deployed in post-war diplomacy and said, right, we're going to, we're going to suggest that NATO now expands into Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, the, Russia said, we're very worried about this. Why are you doing this? What's it for? And the response is, oh, right, we're going to carry on doing it. It annoys you. Right, let's do some more. And you couldn't really think of a more tactless way to behave in international politics. It still amazes me that that, 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 that that was a sequence of events. One year, why are you doing this? The next year, we're doing some more of it. I, it's, it, it can't, you can't really say that it's unreasonable for Russians to worry about it. And one of the most prominent Russian liberals, Yegor Gaidar, in fact, the man responsible for, in my view, some appalling economic reforms, but very much a man of, of Western sensibility, went to the Canadian ambassador in Moscow, who was a friend, and said, can you not ex explain to your NATO colleagues that this NATO expansion is disastrous? It encourages all the worst people, uh, all the aggressive nationalists in Russia, and it does absolutely no good at all. Uh, it's not just Putin who's been objecting to it. It's all kinds of people, I say, from, from, from Solzhenitsyn upwards. Uh, I think that it, it may well be, it's easy to say, oh, well, it's a silly fear, and it, it, there, might be, there might be something in it being a silly fear if we weren't dealing with Russia. But we are dealing with Russia, and Russia is a country which worries uh, about its, its, its position, about its neighbours. So any sensible policymaker should have due regard for that fact and for that history and the, the, and the linguistic imprint of that history in the form of, uh, I can't pronounce it, but Biezhny Pasnos. Pasnos. Well, I would say so. Um, yeah. And I would, I would also say, what was the point of it? What no, were indeed. we trying to achieve? And no, you can go, we can go for hours about this. The, it's always said, well, of course, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, the Baltic states, uh, yeah. joined the join NATO because they were afraid that Russia would invade them. Well, the truth is, the, the, the last act, I think, of the Soviet parliament uh, was to grant independence to those three countries, and that was in 1991. They didn't join NATO, I think, until 2004. If Russia had wanted free of NATO mm. to seize them back, it had 13 years in which it did no such thing. And the same could be said of all the other Warsaw Pact countries which joined NATO supposedly because of the Russian threat. Richard Sakwa, a very interesting historian at the University of Kent, who's written what I think is a very good book on the Ukraine crisis called Frontline Ukraine, has said that the, the, the expansion of NATO has in fact fed and, and increased uh, the, the danger and the worry which it's, it's, it's supposed to be curing. And I think there's something in that. <laughs> Would any of this have happened if NATO expansion had never taken place? Would any of this have happened if NATO had been quietly disbanded with a, with a nice dinner in Brussels, a place where you can have a very nice dinner, I should say, uh, in, 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 say, 1991 or 92, where all the NATO leaders gathered together and said, hey, fantastic, what a triumph. We've actually beaten the evil empire uh, without firing a shot, drunk a lot of champagne and gone home and sold the headquarters. But no, far from it. Uh, they, they've hugely increased uh, the, the size of the headquarters, which cost, I think, about one and a quarter billion dollars to build. It was a spaceport and expanded the organization to about three times its former size, even though the thing it was founded to oppose has disappeared. Poland joined NATO in 1999. The Baltic states followed in 2004. Putin was already in the picture uh, by the late 90s and early 2000s. So how sure can yes. we so how, how sure can we be then? that NATO expansion was responsible for creating the conditions in which Putin could thrive, rather than, as I say, the internal dynamics of a revanchist Russia on the rise. 
Well, you can argue about it, can't you? I would say that the Putin who, who took over from Yeltsin at the turn of the century was not the same man as he is now, okay. uh, especially in foreign policy. And he was very willing. Uh, it's um, Angus Roxburgh's book on Putin is quite quite good on this. He's very willing to to be cooperative with the with the United States, for instance, over two thousand and one over Afghanistan, uh, the the whole nine eleven business. Mm. Anxious to be cooperative and friendly, the, the and the United States had a problem in that they their principal uh, Russian experts were Soviet experts, notably Condoleezza Rice, who continued to think they were dealing with the Soviet Union rather than Russia. Mm. Uh, but I think the initial the initial Putin era of foreign policy uh, was, how shall I put it, a good deal less aggressively inclined uh, than the later era. And Putin, the, the, yeah. the Putin we have now is partly a product of NATO expansion. Okay. Uh, and I, that, that would be my contention, because the, right. remember, he's not, everybody thinks of him as some kind of uh, supreme Stalin type dictator, but in fact, his power is, is limited. There right. are numbers of organizations in the, in the Russian state, which I, I think he quite possibly struggles to control completely. And in those, there are many quite severe and worrying uh, Russian ultranationalists. Uh, whose voices have grown louder as this has gone on. And I suspect that he's responded to that. Do you, and I accept your point that the, the continued existence of NATO after 91 is, is somewhat symbolic. It's, it's as obsolete as the idea of the seventh, as the seventh coalition against Napoleon or, or whatever. But purely for symbolic reasons, do you think that Russia could and should have perhaps joined NATO in the early 2000s? That, would that have tranquilized this issue? Well, it's very difficult to make that proposition because the problem with all the European institutions is that Russian membership would, would overbalance them. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons why the, the idea of Russia joining the European Union is so seriously considered mm -hmm. either. Not that it's remotely politically or economically up to it, in my view, but if it were to be considered, it, because these organizations in European terms, in, in general terms, that um, NATO is utterly dominated by the United States, but in European terms, they're dominated in, in NATO's case by Britain, France and Germany, and in the European Union's case by Germany. And if you introduced a country the size of Russia into, into that situation, it would, it would completely upturn uh, the whole nature of the organization. Also, one would have to say, if Russia joined NATO, what would NATO be for exactly? Uh, what, what, who, 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 would they, who, who would they actually be allying for or against? I think it's almost certainly like, nonsense. It's like As attempts like were made to... So attempts were made to have a sort of integration, a semi-integration of Russia into NATO, but they were very half-hearted and they came predictably to nothing. There used to be, as for the European Union, there used to be near the foreign ministry in Moscow, a cafe called, called the Cafe Schengen, uh, which had been named as a kind of act of resentment against the fact that, that Russian citizens couldn't travel freely uh, to the European Union. They wanted to be part of, of, of this new common European home that Gorbachev used to go on about, and they felt excluded from it. But ultimately, we know the European Union is um, is, is is a German uh, organization, not a Russian one. If, if Russia came into it, that would have to end. It would become a completely different sort of organization. So I think that's unrealistic. I think that there always had there was always going to be some sort of division. The question is whether it had to be turned into uh, a militarized iron border between Russia and the rest of, of, of Europe, in, in which all the old Warsaw Pact countries and, and chunks of the Soviet Union, uh, as had been, uh, were all absorbed into, into new Western organizations. What's wrong with neutrality all of a sudden? Yes. Uh, it's, it's, not, it, it, it's served Austria very well. In, in my view, it serves Finland and, and Sweden quite well up till now. Well, why, why was it not considered more as a way of dealing with the, the the rebirth of Eastern and Central Europe after the long oppression of, of, of Soviet power. I'm not sure. I think it, it, it would certainly have been more successful than what we have. Speaking of um, uh, Sweden and Finland, which are now um, making moves to, to join NATO, from where we are now, what is your response to those who say that the current, the, the recent invasion uh, demonstrates the ongoing need for NATO as opposed to its obsolescence? Well, I'm not sure that it's true. For instance, I mean, there isn't very much doubt, is that the, the, the Western countries have been doing a great deal to arm Ukraine uh, 
against Russia in this war. In fact, the, the, the House of Commons Library recently produced a very interesting briefing paper in which it showed that American military and political aid to Ukraine dates back to 1991, the first year of Ukrainian independence. Uh, Britain's contribution is more recent. Uh, I'm not sure that even if Ukraine were a member of NATO, that there would have been a rush, for instance, to send uh, to send NATO troops in. NATO is, well, how can I put this? It's something of a bluff. Uh, the, the, the famous article which supposedly calls everyone to the aid of, 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 of any member which is attacked is actually very loosely drawn. It couldn't have been otherwise because the United States would never have signed it otherwise. Uh, the, it, it, it's, it, it, it doesn't oblige member states to come to the military aid of attack nation. It, it, it allows them to do so. Uh, actually, also what it doesn't do, it doesn't stop NATO members from coming to the aid of a nation which has been attacked. So there's nothing in the NATO Charter which prevents NATO members if they wanted to. Uh, from sending military uh, military detachments directly to Ukraine, but they've decided for, for reasons it's not hard to guess that they aren't going to do that. So I'm not sure. It's, I'm not sure how strong or how valid the NATO promise is. There was always, even in the Cold War years when NATO was success, there was always this worry in, in Germany, would the United States actually sacrifice Chicago for Frankfurt? Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody was sure. That was why the intermediate range nuclear weapons crisis came up. Uh, because it was it was decided that once the Russians uh, were going to base uh, missiles in Europe, which could which could start a major nuclear war or be used in a major nuclear war without um, without using ICBMs, which threatened the United States, it became urgent for the for, 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 for the Americans to install Pershing two and cruise missiles on European soil, so there would be a proportionate response to that. It's a very interesting period, and it, it, it was only through the, the, the doggedness of the Reagan administration that it came to a successful end, because if they'd managed to, to scare us into not deploying cruise and Pershing 2 missiles, I think the detachment of, of Germany from, from NATO might have been a distinct possibility. So that, but these complicated things are, are in the backs of people's minds when it comes to nuclear war, uh, precisely because it's very difficult to imagine anyone starting it. So I don't know. I'm not sure that NATO is such a terrific guarantee as people think it is to those that join it. Uh, Britain is terribly given to making guarantees to countries on continental Europe, uh, from, yeah. from Denmark under Palmerston to, to, to Poland under Neville Chamberlain, but it's not very good at fulfilling them. I see. Um, quite apart from what you regard as 30 years of Western blunders, do you think that there's anything that the Western powers could have done in the short term to avert uh, this crisis, this war? what you call the short term I mean, it's really okay. basically in any case it's, it's it's apart from the, the the need for a far better effort to bring russia into the comedy of civilized nations back in 1991 a moment i have to say of, of, of huge opportunity and promise thrown away it seems to me in retrospect with the most extraordinary folly uh it's it, it's it's this extraordinary i mean I, you, the, the problem with almost all modern debates, Hitchens' is third law of politics, I've forgotten the first two, but the, the third law of politics is that it's, it's a deep disadvantage in any modern political discussion to know anything about the, the subject under debate. Uh, it, it, it just, it, the, the, the attitude of people towards Russia, who haven't been there, don't know it, don't understand it. It's, it's a place full of bears, snow, funny alphabet, uh, and tyranny, uh, and, and, and they, yeah, they've got Tolstoy and and, uh, and Tchaikovsky, but yeah. actually, it's rather barbaric. It's on the fringe of civilization. It's not to be trusted. It's not very nice, and people just turn away. They don't really, they don't really think that it is part of Europe or part of the civilized world, and they develop prejudices against it and fear and uh, unnecessary fears of it. And these could be self-fulfilling prophecies. I just think over and over again, there's been an absence of willingness to even attempt to understand that Russia has a position. That, that it, it, you, you say, people say, well, should, should, doesn't Ukraine, they say, have the right to join any alliance that it likes? I, say, I don't know where rights to join alliances come from. I'm not sure what the, what the basis of any rights in, in, in international relations are, but it is undoubtedly the case that if uh, the, the, the countries uh, do not like uh, their close neighbors uh, forming military alliances, uh, with countries they regard as threats. I mean, you just need to say, what would, if, if, the, if Mexico developed a political movement uh, 
uh, which 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 demanded the return of the, the land seized by the United States from Mexico in 1848, which includes California. And that movement came to power in Mexico City by majority vote and began to campaign for this and formed an alliance with China against the United States. What do you think the American government would do? Like I'm telling you, absolutely one thing for sure, nothing is one of the things they would not do. Uh, they would, the, things would happen in Mexico, which would discourage the formation and continuation of any such government. It's just a fact of life. The history of England, uh, I'm not saying Britain here, because it's an important distinction. The history of England is largely composed of English monarchs bashing the Scots because the Scots were forming alliances with our enemies, the French. Yes. Uh, it, it, sure, Scotland had a right, if such a right exists, to form an alliance with the French, but I have to say it would have been naive to be surprised if Britain was pleased by this yes. uh, or did nothing about it. This is just a fact of life. So mm. if, if, if you go out in wet weather, uh, take a, a raincoat or an umbrella. If you if you form an alliance with the with, with with the the enemies or rivals of a close neighbour, don't be surprised if they get cross. Uh, this is basic uh, understanding of, 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 of politics, and to pretend that these 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 rules don't exist, uh, it, it's it, it's it's just naive beyond belief. It doesn't mean I think Russia should have a veto. I just say Russia is, is will as a country have int interests which it is bound uh, to, uh, to to express and which if it feels a threat it will attempt to defend. Uh, that again moves on to the next point. Does that mean I justify defend uh, the, the 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 stupid barbaric moronic invasion of Ukraine by Vladimir Putin? No, I absolutely do not. It's stupid, barbaric, lawless, and and and, and without any kind. Of, of justification at all, but it does mean uh, that it's it, it is part of the explanation for it that this behaviour happened. And I have in support of this, Mr. Robert Kagan, uh, the well-known uh, neoconservative uh, figure in Washington who happens to be married to Victoria Newland, the the, the strongly neoconservative yes. uh, State Department senior official under both Obama and Biden, who's been prominent in the Ukraine crisis, and he says uh, in the current issue of Foreign Affairs. Uh, that it's ridiculous to, to to maintain that the 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 West policy has had no influence on these events because it has. No one calls him a Putin apologist or a war crimes mm -hmm. denier the way they call me one. Yeah. Let them try is what I say. See what they get. Yes. I don't think he'd be pleased. <laughs> I or what his misses. I mean, it's just, it's just ridiculous. You can't discuss this subject without being I agree. No, I do agree, and it's regrettable, um, to say the least. Let's say the short back to the question of short term, let's say in the last year or so, do you think there are any concessions that the Western powers could have offered Putin to avert this in invasion? I know it would have been a bit late well, in the day, but it wasn't threatening an invasion. This is the whole thing. The invasion came as a complete surprise to, to me, including, I have to say, it's not just me, including President Zelensky of Ukraine, who was who was trying to talk down all this invasion talk in the, in, in the, in the Did he not did he there. did he not issue a um, a statement on the hist the historic anomaly of Ukraine in, in the summer of last year, which some okay, but, 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 but this half the people don't understand what this means. Okay. Uh, there's a people have built on these speeches and articles a, 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 a series of policies which are, don't necessarily follow from the what the what Russia is alarmed about is not the existence of, a, of, of an independent Ukraine. It's accepted that since 1991 without question. It's alarmed about the its transformation from a, a neutral neighbor into a, an active member of an, of an alliance of the rival bloc. And they're not, it's, Russia doesn't have, even if it wanted to, the power to invade and subjugate uh, and occupy a country the size of Ukraine. It would have, need to have a, with a much larger and a much better army than it has or can afford to do so. What it is alarmed by is the is, is the is the disaffection of that Ukraine, which is now, I'm afraid, thanks to the invasion, probably certain forever, mm -hmm. uh, into a it, it, into a, 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 a I won't say necessarily hostile, but a, a, an unfriendly uh, ally of, of of countries it, it regards as unfriendly for the, for the foreseeable future. This is one of the things about Putin's policies. I mean, what he's done. What he did by by supporting the the, the, the Donbass so-called rebels and uh, in 
in, in the east of Ukraine after 2014 was actually to make Ukraine much more of a united country uh, and much more of a Western country than it had been before. It's, it's, it, these, these policies have been foolish and failed. And you, you would have thought that you might have learned from that enough to know that invading mm -hmm. Ukraine would be not just a crime, uh, as Talleyrand said, but a mistake. Uh, but he doesn't seem to have, have done that. Uh, but it, I, I'm not sure quite how I got here, but it, the, 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 the concern, the Russian concern has been that, that Ukraine, this has been very beautifully expressed by Spigniew Brzezinski in his the Grand Chessboard, in which he discussed in 1997 the extraordinary importance of the development of an independent Ukraine and how without it, uh, Russia was was a very much more unimportant power than, than with it. But I don't think he meant when he wrote that without it in it being actually in within Russia's borders. And I don't think Putin meant that either what he meant without it being an ally of Russia. Uh, and I think it, Russia would have been content to have Ukraine continue as neutral. And the, the, the idea we were constantly told of Yanukovych, the president who was overthrown by the 2014 putsch, was a was a pro-Russian figure. It's not true. He he gave Putin a very hard time, for instance, over the renewal of the lease of Sevastopol and made him pay through the nose for it. And Putin was very angry about that. And Putin didn't like him personally either. So the idea he was some kind of, of, of Russian patsy doesn't really stand out to examination. He was an independent Ukrainian leader, but he he didn't he didn't lean necessarily to the West either. And the other problem with Ukraine was was from the beginning and Yeltsin raised this immediately after independence was that it, it went into independence while having within its borders quite a large number of Russians who didn't necessarily want to be ruled by Ukraine. Uh, that would be more of a problem for Ukraine if they hadn't been removed from U Ukrainian rule by the by the Donetsk and Lugansk pseudo republics and by the, 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 the seizure of Crimea. Uh, a lot of the other Russian-speaking Ukrainians have probably become much more Ukrainian than they ever were before as a result of recent yeah. actions. But yeah. it is a problem. It was a problem which Yeltsin felt it was quite reasonable to raise, and he was immediately shut up about it, mm -hmm. presumably by the United States, because they didn't want any revision of European borders. Well, that's all very well. We're supposed to say that borders of Europe shouldn't be revised. And yet we have revised the European borders. We completely revised the borders of former Yugoslavia. And that's included the secession of Kosovo from Serbia. Uh, so it, 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 it seems to me it would have saved an awful lot of trouble if, if, we had, if everybody had been willing to talk back in 1991 about some sort of arrangement which would have left Ukraine a more Ukrainian country from the start. It would have saved an awful lot of trouble we now have. But I'm afraid that's a dead issue now. It's all gone. Yes, and 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 uh, you note in a in a well, I say recent maybe three weeks ago a piece on Sevastopol in the Mail on Sunday that Ukrainian nationalism hasn't always been so hospitable to those Russian speakers you mentioned. Um, uh, everyone should read that if they haven't already. I, I would just like to ask a very quick question. Neil Ferguson, the historian, had a piece in the Spectator recently, and I'm going to put to you something that he said. Um, he argues that Putin wants to resurrect the old Tsarist Russian Empire that he's animated by dreams of being the next Peter the Great and what have you, and that the threat of NATO expansion is just a convenient pretext for an invasion that is long in the making. But it sounds like you don't accept that it's long in the making. It, it's well, politique, it's realist I, and strategizing. I, I, can't, I can't read the mind of Vladimir Putin or indeed of his yeah. successors, whoever they may be. What I can do is I can, I, I can read the figures on the on the state of the, of the, of the Russian economy and I can yeah. pass on what knowledge I have of the nature of Russian society as it is, and particularly the appalling levels of corruption uh, that, that, that are involved, and the, the terrible social dislocation that was lasting for three quarters of a century of Leninism, which did enormous damage to culture and, and morals in a country already wrecked by war and civil war. And people don't understand just how low it has sunk. Uh, I put it just put in a word here for an extraordinary film made by Stanislav Gavrilukin called Takjit Nizia, We Can't Live Like This, which was released in 1990. It was the first admission of just how low Russia had sunk as a society and a culture, uh, thanks to all that all those long years of communist rule, which people don't realize it was a seriously, a very, very seriously damaged country and society. How this country is ever going. Uh, to 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 get beyond its current state of, of corruption and mess, I don't know.
but it just doesn't seem to me that anybody in possession of the facts could realistically believe uh, that it could recreate the old Tsarist Empire. We've got a history lesson here uh, and, and, and mentioned my favorite 20th century unknown politician, the amazing Richard von Kilman, the, the last, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm's last foreign minister, uh, the man who invented the, the, the idea of limited sovereignty, which he, he, which he, with which he intended to seduce former Russian imperial possessions away from Russian rule and give them the, the simulacrum, the appearance of independence while they actually became German satellites. Uh, and this was put a huge bomb under the Russian Empire forever. And people are never going to go back to being a, a Russian province if the alternative is to, is to have at least the outward appearance of being an independent country. Uh, so uh, unless Russia could get used to the idea of offering limited sovereignty to its former, uh, to its former possessions, then that's, that's never going to catch on. That leaves, as I say, an area in which neutrality might be explored. But that era of, of German politics, and the, the brilliance of it, which is forgotten now because the brest litovsk Treaty, which was one of the first steps in it, was cancelled by the defeat of Germany in 1918, uh, gives a clue as to, as to what has subsequently happened in that part of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, it is, uh, it, it's not as, the, how anyone could reassemble uh, the Russian Empire, as it was before 1914, now with uh, which, which the Russian Empire in 1914 was unable to defend uh, or keep in being. I do not know. I, I completely accept that it's not a feasible project. But one of the points you did um, make at the beginning, when I asked you if you'd changed your mind, is the fact that you thought there was a semblance of rationality to Putin's character prior to this invasion. Perhaps he's just lost it. I mean, and if he has lost it then perhaps he's not going to be uh, too awake to those limits that you describe. Um, and maybe, it, do you think it's possible that we might be projecting a rationalist vision, sorry, a, a, a realist foreign policy paradigm onto his character that just does not fit it? It's possible. Mm. Uh, how can we tell? I didn't know, I was, I was, when I woke that morning and found out the invasion of Ukraine had started, I, I was just, uh, it, it took me, some minutes of staring at the radio thinking can this actually be true have they got it right and then listening over and it was clear that it, it was and against all my hopes and wishes that the, the the facts had changed irrevocably and therefore i had to change my mind yes. but in, in this case i think i mean you, you would guys should make one point here we don't know because it's never been formally announced exactly what the purpose of the of the russian invasion of ukraine is Indeed. Yeah. were they intending to, to seize and capture kiev uh were they intending to to, to take zelensky captive and, and occupy the country or yeah. was there some other purpose which we don't know i think there's a lot of jumping conclusions here as to what it was they were intending to do whatever it was they've plainly failed in some of it because they were they were they were badly beaten back by by forces which were much better equipped and organized than they plainly expected uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean again that the that, that what was defeated was the full-scale invasion and occupation plan because i don't think Anyone anybody with any knowledge of military power would ever have said that they had the forces to, to achieve that it's simply the, the army they, they, they deployed simply wasn't big enough for that purpose. In historical terms, I can't think of any army that small has achieved a, a, a target so great. But that, that, this is just all guesswork and speculation. I can't. No, you're, so. you're, you're right. He, he may have been Putin. That is, may, may have just been trying to force the issue over the Donbass and to turn Ukraine into. Well, a there's job. another thing he may have been trying to do. Yes. I, if you if you see him simply as a protection racketeer, yes. uh, smashing up the joint. Uh, to, to to make a point, uh, to, to warn to warn the United States and everybody else that if they they proceed with this uh, with this policy of NATO expansion in this direction, then he has at the very least the power to ruin Ukraine. Indeed, uh, that may be what he's he's doing: simply smashing it up, making it ungovernable, making its future impossible, turning it into a country of refugees and frozen conflict. Yes. Uh, I, the people are cynical enough to, to do things like Absolutely. that. And it's not Absolutely. to be ruled out as a possibility. And that, that could mean a very, very long war. Indeed. Uh, one which will still be going on long after my funeral. Gosh, well, let's hope not. Um, ah, well, you know, I mean, it's, I'm just making the point. I mean, I'm not telling you to die tomorrow, but this, is, <laughs> this has, has the makings and look of a, of a war 
possibly longer than the one in, in, in Syria, which uh, yes. has also caused total disaster to the to, to the country, which uh, people allegedly they were trying to save. 11 years old at this point. Three more questions for you, Mr. Hitchens. Thank you for, for joining me and staying with me for this long. It's been very interesting so far. I hope you found it mildly interesting yourself. Um, you argue that economic sanctions imposed on Russia will only uh, cause suffering to the poorest in that country. How should the West respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, especially after the alleged Bucha, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, massacres? I, with the, on the question of sanctions, I answer they only affect the poor. Of course, they affect the rich and the powerful, but the rich and the powerful are usually very, very good at evading them. The, the general outcome of sanctions, think of uh, Iraq, which used to contain a large, very pro Western middle class, now wiped out, yes. uh, for instance. Uh, the, you think of the sanctions on Iran, which simply make life a misery for, for large numbers of perfectly innocent people who have nothing to do with the regime and no power over it. Uh, then I, I just I shrink with horror at the idea that at some point my own country might be targeted with sanctions of this kind and the, yeah. the horrible miseries and ruin which they bring to people trying simply to, 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 to raise children and, and do a decent job and live a decent life. Yeah. I, don't, I think sanctions are a, a cowardly politician's way of looking as if they're doing something yes. which, which are very, very hard to end once they've started, linger for years and, and ruin, let's say, the lives of innocent people. And I'm against them. And, I think and more harden, people speak and, on, on, and, on harden and harden opposition as well to the country. So, I mean, if, 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 if the alternative was between doing sanctions and doing nothing, then I would say do nothing. My, of course, my, my view goes back before all this. I think that there was a serious uh, danger of, of I, I found out in my own writings from long ago, suggesting there was a danger of war over this problem. Yes. Many years ago, I think a war in this region was one of the more foreseeable wars of recent times, and that it could have been prevented. I think, particularly, the Minsk II. Uh, formula uh, could have been pursued more energetically by Western powers. And remember also that Zelensky himself was elected as president on a peace platform. Yes. And he made very serious efforts to his enormous credit. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, for Vladimir Zelensky. I think he's, he's, he's a man who's proved himself uh, very well in, in, in many ways, but he, he made a very serious effort to obtain peace when he, when he became president. And he was frustrated uh, not by his uh, Russian interlocutors, but, but by hardliners in his own country. Uh, these hardliners who we're not allowed to mention anymore, but the, I'm afraid there, there are some very strong influences on Ukrainian politics, which are not very nice, and which played a very large part in frustrating peace. Now, I believe myself that if the Western powers, uh, in which I must include the United States and Britain, had been more committed to the idea of, of, of a peace deal, I think it, there might have been one. I think now, that we actually see the horrors of war in Ukraine. And one thing I'll say about atrocities is this, uh, that if you don't like atrocities, then try whatever you do to avoid war, because there will always be atrocities in war and both sides will commit them. Mm -hmm. And to believe that uh, only one side commits atrocities in war is, is, is naive in the extreme. If you want these things to end, then end the war. And I've been shocked. Yes. As someone who grew up in the era of Dag Hammarskjöld and, uh, and Uthant and all the rest of it, the, what appears to me to be the almost total disappearance of the United Nations from any kind yes. of attempt uh, to secure peace once this war started. Uh, I think that an effort to make peace invariably involves, we know that it involves uh, making concessions you don't wish to make uh, and, and, and giving people things they oughtn't to have. But if you would rather have millions of people turn into refugees and hundreds of thousands of people turn into corpses, then that's what you have to have instead. Peace is not it's a soft word. It's not, it's not some vicar saying, oh, let's have peace. Peace is a very important uh, responsibility of statesmanship. Mm -hmm. And it involves sometimes accepting things you would rather not accept because you'd rather accept those things than have a continuing position where, where people were being bombed out of their homes driven thousands of miles away from where they live, having their families split, their children killed, horrible murders on their doorstep or indeed inflicted on themselves. Don't we all want that to stop? But you would be very, very hard put to see any evidence from the machinery of international diplomacy and the great powers in the world that anybody is trying very hard to stop this war. I don't see any, do you? No. 
No, I don't. And no, well, exactly. Well, where, with this this must stop. If people want this to end, then they they must accept that there will have to be a peace agreement, and it might contain elements they don't like. But if if, if they if they genuinely prefer war, then let them say so. But in yeah. that case, they must stop complaining about the atrocities of war because these are inevitable when war comes. Well said. Will Putin's regime in Moscow fall, and should we rejoice at such an outcome were that to happen? Well, I don't know, uh, yes. uh, because I have no knowledge of, of, of Russian internal politics, and it, but it's quite possible that whatever followed it might be worse. And lastly, um, there is a sense in which the Russia-Ukraine conflict is a dress, little more than a dress rehearsal for a potential showdown with China over Taiwan, and I'm sure that um, the, uh, I'm sure that Xi Jinping is watching with interest. What lessons do you think can and should be learned? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure that that's so. I think the attitude of the Western countries towards China has been fascinating. Here is in, in 1989 to 1991, the, the evil empire of the Soviet Union, confronted with popular unrest and uprisings and demonstrations in Eastern Europe, uh, gave in. Uh, the Chinese communists in exactly the same period, confronted with popular uprisings and demands for freedom, massacred their own people. Uh, result, ever since, we've been punishing and harassing the Russians and sucking up to the Chinese. Uh, you tell me what the sense of that is and ask me what, uh, answer me this. What do you think will happen if Taiwan applied to join NATO? And yes. don't say it's out of area, because if, 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 if Afghanistan is in the North Atlantic, then Taiwan is too, isn't it? And Libya, yes. And Libya. Okay. Um... Mr. Hitchens, it's been an immense pleasure. Can you tell everyone when your uh, book on grammar schools, it's, it seems trivial compared to the, the subjects we've been discussing, but yeah. it is important. When, when will that be coming out and when can we read it? Well, it's not true, of course. If, if, you, if, if the country deliberately destroys its educated elite and ceases in many ways to have one and, and embarks instead on an education system designed to teach people what to think rather than how to do so, it, it, it leads to all kinds of, of, of problems. And alas, what I've concluded from writing this book is that the, the mistake is irreversible because you destroy, by destroying good state secondary schools, you destroy a, a, a part of your country which can't then be, be replicated. It's gone forever because there's nobody left to teach people how to do the things that they used to do. Uh, when will the book come out? I don't know exactly. I mean, it's going through all those processes, which perhaps you're familiar with, of, 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 of publishers doing this and doing that. Yes. I, I'm hoping very much that, that it might get out before the end of this year, but I can't promise it because it's not wholly under my control. Uh, but I have delivered the, the manuscript, which is the first step. In any case, it's quite brief, I should say. It's not, not one of those long books. Okay. Well, in any case, we look forward to it. Thank you so much for joining me today and have a wonderful rest of your week and all the rest Thank of it. Thank you so much.